So today is the uh, last of a three-part series on generosity. The first week, Pastor Tweedy talked about generosity in service. We had our Aiming to Serve event where Pastor Tweedy talked about that God uses even especially the small things to do great things, that we are all like mustard seeds or the, the yeast and dough that God uses to accomplish great things for his kingdom. And last week we talked about generosity as partnership and that we said when we give and financially give towards the work of mission, we are partners in the gospel and that there are those that are sent but that there are those who send and those together play an integral part in what it means to be on mission. And this week we are going to be talking about generosity in terms of stewardship. Generosity as stewardship. A steward is someone who is placed over uh, an estate as a manager of of resources uh, that are not his own but belong to someone or something else. An example of that uh, in the Old Testament is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a a young man who was uh, sold into slavery by his brothers. You remember the Joseph in the coat of many colors? Because of his father's, Jacob's favoritism of Joseph, the other brothers were jealous. And so they intended on killing him, but instead they sold him into slavery. And he ended up in the house of an Egyptian master whose name was Potiphar. And when Joseph came into Potiphar's house as a servant, the text says that the Lord was with him and the work of his hands so that everything he did prospered. So naturally, Joseph ascended up the ladder, so to speak, until Potiphar placed him over everything in his house. And here's how Genesis 39 puts that. It says that Potiphar put him, Joseph, in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. Joseph was a steward of Potiphar's house. And that's how we want to understand generosity this morning or discuss it in terms of stewardship using as the basis our text from Luke 12, uh, starting in verse 15 through verse 21. Now, this is the parable Jesus tells, which is often called the parable of the rich fool. So let's stand in honor of God's word this morning as we read this parable of Jesus, Luke 12, verses 15 through 21. And then he, that is Jesus, said to them, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will stir up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that carried along the inspired writers to write this down. God, we pray that our time this morning, that your spirit would illumine this text to our hearts and that we would be transformed because of our encounter with you through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we talk about stewardship, we want to say that stewardship is, uh, well, at least as we talk about it this morning, it has three issues to it. We want to say first that stewardship is an issue of the heart. The second thing is we want to say is that stewardship is a matter of the hands. And thirdly is that stewardship is a matter of the feet. So stewardship is a matter of the heart, the hands, and the feet. So what do we mean when we say that stewardship is a matter of the heart? 
Because if we're going to talk about generosity, generosity begins here. Generosity begins with our heart. And that's exactly where Jesus starts as well when he addresses these issues with his hearers. He says this in verse 15, Watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Life is that which we draw, or is our source, really. And what Jesus is saying is your source, where you draw life from, your identity, who you are, does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Because all of us have a void in our lives apart from God. God is the only source of life. But without God, or when we seek to find a substitute for God, we'll grasp at other things to fill that void, and material possessions is a pretty natural place for us to go. And so we think that when we get something or if we have something that we're going to be drawing life from it, and a person who exemplifies that will naturally be greedy. And greed is defined as an intense and selfish desire. Intense and selfish desire. And in a person who is striving to find life from the abundance of their possessions will naturally be greedy. Because what happens is, is when we try to find life in our possessions, that doesn't work. And so we think, and we, we just kind of continue to grasp after the next thing, thinking, well, maybe, although I didn't find life here with this possession, or I didn't find life with this experience, so I'm just, I need to grasp after something else. I, I just need to keep looking, because maybe the next thing is going to fill that void, and it doesn't. It never does, and it never will. So how might we, you know, how does Jesus describe a person that's characterized by a person who is striving to find life in the abundance of possessions? And he puts these words into the mouth of this rich fool where he says this, then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. I will stir up my surplus grain and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, one key into this man's heart is the use of the first person personal pronoun. And so if we it kind of emphasize that, it, we read the text like this. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, me, he says you, but he's meaning him, me, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. You, me, self, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, it's important to note that what is at issue here for Jesus is not the fact that the man had a surplus in his crop. That's not what's at issue. And that's important to note, that there are certain people and certain situations where God allows them to produce a lot of production, a lot of oh, surplus, a lot of money, a lot of whatever. That Jesus doesn't condemn that. Some people are just really good at making money. Some of us aren't so good. What's not at issue here is that. What's at issue is the man's heart. And the man's heart was totally inward and selfish. In fact, really the opposite of greed is mercy. Greed is inward. Greed only thinks about the self where mercy is outward and is interested in others. So one thing we might ask ourselves is, well, how, how might I know this is me? How might I know this is characterizing me? Is there an issue of the heart in my life when it comes to my possessions? First off, we should all recognize that probably to some extent, yes, for all of us. 
We're in a pretty materialistic culture here. So there's not that other cultures don't have this temptation as well, but certainly in a materialistic culture like ours, it's going to be a pretty natural place to go to find life. But just as maybe some further thoughts to say probably all of us to some extent need to be on guard. That's why Jesus says, be on guard, right? Watch out. One thing to think about is to, when you go home today, look around your house. Think about, do you have an overabundance of possessions? And I'm not the one that can gauge that for you. You have to gauge that for yourself. And this doesn't, just because you have a lot of stuff doesn't necessarily in and of itself means that you have greed there. But it might be an indicator, because if you go home and you have this over and abundance of stuff, could it be, is the reason is because you find life, perhaps, by buying and purchasing things. When you get depressed, do you go to Amazon to make yourself feel better? When you feel low, do you go to Target so that you feel better? Because when you go through the checkout line and you buy that thing, Life seems a little bit better than it did before you went. If that's the case, then you are to some extent trying to find life in an abundance of possessions. Possessions is somehow something that you are using to find life other than God. And that's something to ask yourself, only as a question. The other thing to ask yourself, too, is just as a question. When you buy things, do you buy things for their usefulness? Or do you buy things for their status? Do you know the difference between those two? Usefulness versus status. There are things that get the job done for us, and there are certain things that we can buy that we're almost trying to gain life from it. I can buy a shirt that costs $60 that has a certain emblem on it, and I can buy that same shirt for $10 that does not. Does that mean it's a sin to have the one that costs $60? I don't know. <laughs> but are you trying to draw life from it? Is that where you draw life? Look at me, I have this shirt, and that makes me into a certain kind of a person. If that's the case, your identity, to some extent, is being drawing life from the, your clothing. If you have an iPhone, what, is it, what are we up to now? What, what's the number now for an iPhone? Is it 10? Is it 11? It's a 10? X. Well, that's a 10. There you go. X is 10. <laughs> In Roman numerals, at least. It, it, what's the one before that? Did, did they skip 9, if I remember right? So let's say you had an iPhone 8. And it works fine. Do you need an iPhone X? 10? Whatever. Sometimes people do need them, and that's one thing. But if you... Had, you, you have to have the newest gadget. If you have to have the newest technology because of the status that has, look, I have the big screen iPhone X, ask yourself the question, why do you have that? Are you trying to some extent to draw life from it? Think about your car. Is it a sin to have a nice car? I'm not saying that. But if you're trying to draw life and if your car is a status symbol for you, think about that. Your house, everything. Are you drawing life from your possessions? Are you drawing life from who you are in Christ? Because we are going to be tempted, and Jesus says, watch out. Do not try life from the abundance of your possessions. So it starts off as a matter of the heart. Generosity starts with the heart. And then we want to talk about that it's a matter of the hands. You know, there's a difference between a hand position that looks like this and a hand position that looks like this. And a life of generosity as stewardship, let's just say, does not look like this. It looks like this. And what we want to contrast stewardship is with the concept of ownership. Ownership and stewardship are two different things. And I want to suggest that a person who has a basic stance to their possessions as owners lives a life like this. It's mine. I have control of it. I decide what to do with it. It's mine. I earned it. 
Think about the rich fool. How often they say, this is mine, my surplus, my barns, I'll decide. It's the posture of ownership. But according to the Bible, who owns everything? Jesus, God. Psalm 24 opens up by saying that explicitly. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. I love how Exodus 19 just says it really plainly. The whole earth is mine, says God. Everything. And if you think about it, you know, probably the most personal thing that you might be tempted to own, and naturally so, would be your own body. What's more personal, more intimate than your own body? But according to uh, the New Testament, even that's not yours. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you are not your own, but you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. That your body is not yours to decide what to do with, because God has bought it and it belongs to him. Then again, you might, we might be tempted to say something like, yeah, but come on, I earned it. I did the work. I worked hard. I got educated. I put myself in this position, whatever. I was the one who slayed for it. This is mine. Deuteronomy 8 addresses that as well. It says, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands, and in my, my, have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It comes from God. You cannot breathe apart from God. C.S. Lewis, he's just wonderful, but C.S. Lewis puts it pretty well and pretty memorably the same sort of sentiment. He says this, that every faculty you have, your power of thinking or of moving, your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. So that when we talk of a man doing anything of God or giving anything to God, I will tell you what it's really like. It's like a child going to his father and saying, Daddy, give me sixpence to buy you a birthday present. Of course, the father does, and he's pleased with the child's present. It's all very nice and proper, but only an idiot would think that the father is sixpence to the good on the transaction. <laughs> and yet, oftentimes, this is how we think about God. Can you give anything to God that he does not already have? No. It all belongs to him. So if we are going to have a stance of stewardship, then instead of sitting like this, we need to have a posture of our hands like this. This posture recognizes that nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to God. And we offer it up to him which means that God is free to do whatever he wants with it. And by having this hands posture, you are making all that you are and all that you have available to God to do what he wants with it. He dictates what you do, which is why the Christian life is a life of faith and a life of discernment. What is God asking me to do? Now, he knows what you need, and the scriptures say that. He knows that you need food. He knows that you need clothing and shelter. And so God provides for his people. But it's up to him what ultimately happens with it. But that's a pretty big gap, by the way. It's a pretty big gap to go from a thinking of being an owner to being a steward. That's pretty fair. I mean, to go from the sense that I'm a, an owner of my things, I decide what I do with it, to being a steward where it's available to God to do whatever he wants with it. And one way we can begin to take steps towards moving away from ownership and moving towards stewardship is to be in the habit, the regular habit, of giving things away. The habit of giving things away. And I'm not talking about the thing that you would have thrown away anyway. You ever do that? Well, I was going to throw it away anyway. Do you want it? 
I'm talking about things that you have an attachment to. I'm talking about things that matter to you, that maybe someone else needs more than you. And maybe you would discern from God that he would ask you to give that away, to bless somebody else. And I would urge you, and I urge this to myself, to be in the habit of doing that. When you begin to be in the habit of giving things away, obviously you can't give away everything, you wouldn't have anything left, but you have to discern from God where is he asking you to do this. To begin to be in the habit of, you know, what are the things that I have? How can I meet people's needs? And maybe God's asking me to give this away to this other person, to make that a habit in your life. Because then we are recognizing that the ownership of all that we have is not us. Your house is not yours. Your car is not yours. Your clothes are not yours. Your bank account is not yours. Your 401k is not yours. Your golf clubs are not yours. Everything is not yours. Who does it belong to? But you are a steward and a manager of it. So it's a matter of the heart to begin with. It's a matter of the hands. And lastly, it's a matter of the feet. Because feet are how we get around. It's our source of movement. So if we are going to have a heart that's attuned towards God and is attuned towards mercy, and we have hands that make things available, we need to move towards those in need. Move towards them. And I think that's what God is getting at here, or Jesus, when he says this. This is how it will be, right, for those who store up things for themselves but are not rich towards God. Because we said that when we offer up things to God, we aren't, in a sense, enriching him. You cannot enrich him. He already owns it all. So what does he mean by saying being rich towards God? I think what he's saying is, is that this all becomes available to God to be used for his purposes. And when we do that, we are rich towards him, and we begin to take a mind into ourselves as that mind of Christ Jesus. Philippians 2 says that each of you should be concerned not only with your own interests, but with the interests of others as well. So the Bible recognizes you have interests. You need food. You need clothing. We got it. But you are not to be concerned only with that, but you are to be concerned with the interests of others. And if you are to be concerned with them, you must move with your feet towards them, even if metaphorically, move towards them and their needs. 1 John 3.17 this is very explicit. He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need and has no pity, how can the love of God be in that person. That's pretty serious. It's a matter of the heart. Is your heart turned inward or is your heart turned outward? And when we live this life, we are, we are moving into the ideal of what God wants for us individually and as a church, as a people who are to be God and Jesus to the world. And we see this in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 says, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything that they had. And God's grace was so powerfully at work that there was no needy persons among them. No one claimed that their possessions were their own. In a culture like ours, that can be a difficult thing to hear. Your possessions are not your own. In a sense, they belong to others. In a sense. Because if there's another in need and you don't meet their need with the abundance possessions that you have, the love of God apparently is not in you. And if the love of God is not in you, then there's bigger conversations to be had about the gospel and what it means for the grace of God to meet us where we are, to transform us and to make us and to mold us into little Christs. 
So if the issue of the heart is to ask the question, look at the abundance of your possessions. What does that say about you? Is there something going on in your heart that you need to be before God and talk about God with that? Are you, do you buy things for their status and the way it makes you look and the life you draw from them? Or because they're useful and you need them? Can we be in the habit of giving things away as we offer everything before God? And lastly, if it's a matter of the feet, this is a final thought. We are pretty quick, or let's just maybe say, I'm pretty quick. When I see someone in need to think someone else will do that, someone else will help them. You know what I'm saying? Someone else will get to that. I'm busy. I don't have enough money. I don't have the resources to meet the need. Somebody else will. Somebody else will do that. I'm suggesting that we stop saying that. And rather than saying someone else will do it, let's begin to ask the question, how is God asking me to do it? What way can I enter into somebody's life? Even if it's not a big deal to me, maybe it's a small thing, how can I begin to do that and to meet that need? Rather than saying, you know what, somebody else will do it. Jesus didn't say somebody else will do it. Jesus said, I will do it. And how can we take on in ourselves the mind of Christ? Because generosity as stewardship begins with the heart, it moves to the hands, and it ends in the feet. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you, Jesus, had a heart full of mercy, attuned to our need and the needs of creation. God, thank you that your hands were placed in the position of submission, recognizing that all things belong to God, and that your feet brought you into our situation and bring you into our situation right now in 2018. And God, I pray that you would transform our hearts, our hands, and our feet to make us generous and to make us stewards of your resources and that we would be wise and merciful and generous stewards. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.